There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. Today we're in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Museum of International Folk Art. It holds more than 150,000 objects spanning Spanish colonial Peru to modern day New Mexico. The textiles, ceramics, wood carvings, clay figures, jewelry, prints, puppets, and more have found their way here from all around the globe. Today we're going to explore a one-of-a-kind exhibition that's made this museum a destination for over two million visitors. With over 10,000 detailed objects in this single exhibit, it's absolutely amazing. Then we'll see the breadth of the museum's folk art collection when we go behind the scenes in the private collections area where scholars conduct research to learn more about the cultures of people from around the world. So are you ready to explore the whimsical world of folk art? Let's go. It's so much fun to be down here in the Southwest and what a fantastic museum here in Santa Fe. Tell me more about it. The museum was opened in 1953 okay. and we were founded by Florence Dibble Bartlett who was uh, from Chicago and she came from an art collecting family. Her sister May opened the Heard Museum in Phoenix oh, wow. and her brother was a painter and, and important earlier collector of, of Impressionist art. And, and so, was she focusing on folk art herself? All through her life she focused on folk art and especially folk textiles also. Oh and she traveled all over the world in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, collecting textiles and dress and uh, rare objects and jewelry. Her ideas around folk art and traditional art were that they could be bridges that would unite people who didn't otherwise didn't share anything. But you're not focusing just on the Southwest. You're not even focusing just on the United States, are you? No, we have a global collection. It was like that from the very beginning with uh, the core of Bartlett's collecting. And so we, from the very beginning, there was amazing clothing and, and folk art from Sweden. There were objects from Mexico. There really? were Peruvian I I items. Um, there were lots of things from Central and, Central and Southeast Europe. Um, amazing collections from Russia and the Middle East as well. Well, let's talk about the genre of folk art. Explain what that means. Well, folk art is, we like to think of it as a conversation or maybe even like a moving target. Oh. <laughs> so there are, some, there are some pieces and kinds of art that, that um, are widely recognized as, as, as folk art. We just talked mm -hmm. about quilts, for example, sure. or you know, different kinds of pottery or different kinds of textiles from around the world. You could think of like Guatemalan women's textiles that we peel as really classic examples of what folk or traditional arts are. But they're uh, decorative too, right? I mean, they're not, not just for a utilitarian reason. Absolutely, so they frequently, frequently they, they are utilitarian, and but usually all over the world we find that people like to elaborate them in the most amazing ways. And folk art also is frequently passed down as traditions. So it tends to go with um, like uh, religious groups or, mm -hmm. or uh, ethnic groups or language groups. Um, that's why you might have like Polish paper cuts or different kinds of Mexican ceramics or uh, Peruvian textiles. Were they considered collectible during their time of use? Or when did the appeal start coming for people to start collecting folk art? Well, it really depends, but a lot of it begins in the 20th century when there's a lot of interest in these traditions that are not part of the modern world. I see. And the idea was that, that people began to collect these objects that evoked an, a less machine age time. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and also, I mean, when you get a collector, tell me about the space that we're in now. This, this is a collector that is beyond the normal definition of a collector, don't you think? <laughs> We're in the Alexander Gerard Wing here at our museum, which opened in 1982, and the wing was uh, the work of, of Alexander Gerard, who was a designer. 
and he designed every one of these uh, these dioramas that he called sets, and he collected uh, over 100,000 items from all over the world, and there's about 10,000 permanently installed in this room. Oh my God. So would he do it thematically, or was it by country? How was he organizing this, even in his own mind, to collect? Both thematically and by country. And so okay. he, um, we know he collected with an eventual hope to be able to install these these sets somewhere. And he did install them in several different uh, versions uh, leading up to 82 when we opened. But so for example, this amazing installation this of, of a Mexican village is all the work of one artist studio um, whose name is, was uh, Jaron, Jaron Martinez okay. and from the southern, uh, from the, a city called Acatlan in southern Puebla in okay. Mexico. And Gerard and Martinez family was a well-known ceramic art-making family in that town. Mm -hmm. And but uh, Jaron Martinez was a, was the most prominent of them. And uh, Gerard went to his studio and commissioned many of these pieces. So he would say, well, "I want a church of roughly this scale, and I need 35 buildings. I need a jail. I need a train. I need 300 cactuses um, oh. and villagers. And I need get to work. <laughs> uh, yes, I need I need a funeral scene." Um, and the Gerard Wing doesn't have any labels. I mean, it's an, it, it's an artist installation. Before that was a common practice in our world. Um, so it, it predates those the artist installation phase in, in, in the museum world yeah. by, uh, by several years. But mm -hmm. he wanted to give you a feel for um, what life was like in many of the countries of origin. So it's not an anthropologist's view. Uh, it's not even a museum curator view mm -hmm. of these foreign cultures. It's Gerard's view. And I think I saw something that might have been a baptism, but it seems to introduce a, another element to these uh, exhibits, perspective. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. There are a couple of there are several baptism scenes here in in the Gerard Wing. The one that is a crowd favorite is by the fam the Aguilar family from Oaxaca, and it's Josefina Aguilar and her family. She's still alive, uh, but she makes these really wonderful figurative ceramics, and um, sometimes they make whole scenes. And he would have gone to her family and said, "I'd like to have a, a, a nativity scene with roughly this number of figures." Um, and he, he reworked it into this, into this scene that has a recession in space. So there's a kind of forced perspective mm -hmm. that looks like a little theater set. Yes. And um, it relates really closely to these paper theaters that Gerard played with when he was a child. And there's, we have over 10,000 of those paper theaters in our collection as well. Oh, and, cool. and we have several on display, but that idea about setting up a forced perspective with recession in space and the adjustment of the figures, the scaling of the figures back into space. That was very important to him. Tell me about this church, that's the spectacular church. The church, we, he would have commissioned that from the artist. Okay. But what's interesting about it is that, it, um, that many artists in that village make, make and continue to make these ceramic churches. But this, was, this is really an amazing example. Um, the, and what we know on the outside is, is there really are Spanish colonial churches in Mexico that are made old, totally of tile on the outside or painted these amazing colors on the outside wow. in central Mexico. Um, really? And so this is a kind of evocation of that. Yeah. Um, and the designs on it are, are drawn from uh, different kinds of folk designs and also some interesting designs that com come from the pre-Columbian world, from ancient Mexico. And we know that uh, almost certainly the artists were studying books that had um, drawings of ancient Mexican art, and so they're pulling that from the past into the present, oh, that's which incredible. is an interesting. Um, it's not it's not an unbroken tradition, but it's mm -hmm. but it is a very interesting way of thinking about how the past lives in the present. Well, and I'm also seeing it, the inside of it almost looks lit. I mean, was that on purpose? Because normally it would look very dark. You wouldn't even see a priest inside. It would look very dark, and when Gerard lit lit this uh, this room, he actually put a mirror in the church and so that the light would be reflected into the space. And there's a little priest saying mass inside the church. And so that sense of wonder and discovery was very important to Gerard um, also. And we didn't know that actually because mm -hmm. uh, until we recently cleaned the church uh, uh -huh. and all the rest of these more than a thousand pieces that are, that are in this one diorama. Oh my God. And when we pulled the church out, dusted it and vacuumed it, um, they found the mirror in the church and we realized what it was. and, and now you can, of now you can yeah. look inside the church and see who's in there and what's happening. Well, and it looks like there are not only villages, but I'm seeing all sorts of celebrations. Tell me about some of the other celebrations that are in these dioramas. Well, 
In traveling around the world, Gerard was fascinated by uh, public celebrations and also by uh, markets. So he loved open air markets. Um, who doesn't? Yeah. You got to go see amazing fruits, vegetables, folk art, uh, music, all kinds of things. Sure. And so that was a favorite of his. He was born in the U.S. but grew up in Florence. Um, and Florence, Italy. Florence, Italy. Nice. And growing up, he um, was exposed to lots of church festivals in Florence, and he became really interested in nativity scenes. So there are uh, dozens and dozens of nativity scenes in this in, in this Gerard Wang from all over the world. Unbelievable. Um, and he just kept on going back to them and collecting them. Well, let's talk about, I saw another um, area that was very interesting, and it was the Day of the Dead, which I don't know that much about, but I saw kind of a heaven and hell kind of, um, talk about that, that's very unique. There is one of our unique in, uh, displays here in the Gerard Wing is the heaven and hell display that shows Again, it's an interest in almost like stage stagecraft, yeah. stage stage sets, it where looks he like has a set. yeah, exactly. It does. So yeah. he has um, in up in the clouds, which I think are kata, and he has angels from different cultures. And then there's a there's an earth level, and then there's a hell level that has a mirror and with some black rocks and devil figures from Peru and from Poland. Um, and it's 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 an interesting way of presenting the art. Um, and making it making it come alive. Yeah, and, it really does. And right next to that is there's a whole display on the Day of the Dead from Mexico. And Gerard was fascinated by this, as are many people. And early on, he was collecting it. He went to Mexico on his honeymoon, in the late 30s. Oh. Came back with a carload of folk art, and um, we know of skulls. Almost certainly, <laughs> yeah. yes, sugar skulls sugar and bread skulls, skulls and wow. we have thousands of them. And when when the Gerard Wing opened here at our museum in 1982, that was a, it was less common uh, Day of the Dead than it is today. But it's a celebration, right? It's, it's a mean, celebration of your Day ancestors. Yes, I see. it is. Okay, so and it's not a dark No, not holiday. at all. It's no. a celebratory. No, in Mexico, in some communities, the idea is that on, on those days, November 1st, November 2nd, mm -hmm. your family members can come back and visit you. And so you go to oh. the cemetery and you have a meal with them or you set up an altar in your house and uh, put the things that they like to eat when they were alive and um, like tamales or, or whatever yeah. they like to eat and then you, you spend, the, spend the evening with them is the idea. And so it's a, it's a real celebration. Um, it is populated by what seems like an amazing host of sugar and paper mache skulls yeah. and, <laughs> and breads shaped like bones and skulls, but that's, it's all part of the, of the celebration. There is one of these dioramas that is almost like a dedicated to Alexander Gerard and his family, and it's a diorama of the a little scene of an Italian villa. And inside are figures, are, are some watercolors that um, Gerard did, and also some that his grandmother did. They're watercolors of um, like flowers and botanicals. Mm -hmm. There are also three by Georgia O'Keeffe. In, in you that, Georgia O'Keeffe? Yes, uh, O'Keeffe was friendly with Gerard and. She made these small uh, one pencil drawing and two watercolors of botanicals um, so for, cool. for, that, uh, for that space. Um, there's also a very tiny copy of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy in that space. And there are also two plastic Cupid dolls for the 50s. There's a lot of wit in here, isn't there? There is. Yeah. And yeah. there are some ceramic figurines that his brother, Tunzi Gerard, made. He was a, oh. a 20th century ceramic artist based in Florence, and he did all the ceramic figurines that are uh, in the Italian villa. As a member of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, uh, our museum has a gallery of conscience where we've had exhibitions on uh, immigration, also on uh, natural disasters, oh. also on, uh, there was one on AIDS, but all, all in, through the lens of these folk and traditional arts, because it's, we realize that um, although it may see it sometimes seem that these arts are, are, are isolated from those global issues, they're not. Right? The artists who make these beautiful things are also living in the modern world. And what about classes? Are there classes people can take, or do children come in and learn more? Or? 
We have a, a really active youth program, and it's primarily elementary age, but they come in in thousands per year and have an experience all over the museum. And uh, we try, we work also closely to align with what the teachers need in the area, um, to align with different curriculums. Um, there are also, we also have guest lectures, um, and of course, tours of, tours of the museum. Tell me where we are. This is the coolest space, and it's also ultra clean. <laughs> it is. So we have five uh, collection storage spaces here in the museum. We're in the basement, and um, in the one that we're in is has North American and Latin American collections, as well as Asian and some African. Uh, so you divide where, by countries. Yes, we yeah. do. We do organize our storage space by geography, which reflects how we organize our curatorial responsibilities. So we also have five curators. So how many countries are actually represented at the museum? We have over 100. Whoa, really? That's and, a lot. And we have 130,000 objects plus. And like any museum, um, collection storage is really vitally important to a museum because the vast majority of what a collecting museum will have is not on display, but is in collection storage. And there's a lot, a lot of considerations uh, for how you care for stored objects. Mm -hmm. um, we have these compact storage, um, which you, you turn the, the wheel and they move so that it makes better use, more efficient use of space, sure. so that we can store all those 130,000 objects. And are you cataloging and photographing? I mean, everything? Oh yeah, oh, everything gosh. that comes in is cataloged, photographed. It's usually photographed on more than one occasion. Um, condition reported. Um, often we will make special mounts for storage. Um, sometimes the storage mounts are different than uh, a display. mount for display. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's, it's, it, it is a huge commitment of staff time and, and money and oh, yeah. time. Um, it's, it's a big responsibility. Well, part of the responsibility, if we backtrack a little bit, must be to make sure that everything is critter-free. I mean, how, I mean, when pieces come in that are textiles or I mean, how do you yeah. handle that? So we, um, our collection has a lot of different materials yeah. and the most vulnerable to pests are textiles for sure. Uh, so we have this area that's called white wall and it is our, our clean space and nothing comes into the white wall area, um, which is where all of our collection storage is uh -huh. until it has either gone through the freezer, uh, which kills pests or gone through an anoxia tent, which essentially it, uh, the tent runs for 28 days and it, essentially depletes uh, the space of oxygen, so if there's any critters there, they can no longer live. So after we know we're pest free, then all the objects come into the white wall area and go into processing. And once in the processing room, uh, everything gets cataloged. Things get measured, everything gets described so that we know exactly what it looks like. Everything gets photographed, all of that information, including the information that the curators have have provided about content and context, what it is, what function it served, et cetera. All of that gets put into the database. And, um, and then eventually, someday, all of that information in the database will be searchable by the public. So wow. the ultimate objective is that everything will be online uh, yeah. and accessible yeah. to the public, not just when they're here, and not just what's visible in the in the exhibitions, sure. But that also what's they here? can access it online. So each piece would be photographed and processed, and whoa, it's true. That is there are there are times when um, there are a number of components that comprise a single piece. Sure. Um, um, but yeah, we have a lot of miniatures. <laughs> um, yeah, everything. It's very. It's a very laborious and time-consuming, but important process, sure. so that we know where everything is, and we have a system of barcoding. Um, so every every object has an accession number, and then gets attached a barcode, okay. um, usually on a tag, but, and then numbered on the bottom, um, in a reversible fashion, mm -hmm. so that we know exactly what every object is. So it's numbered twice. It's numbered with written on the object, mm -hmm. as well as a barcode, barcode. tag, wow. so that. At any moment, you can look up any object and know exactly where it is. So, Laura, I see some interesting ceramic pieces over here on the tabletop. What are those? We've got um, 
this platter from Morocco. So what you'll notice is a lot of the pieces that are out here are blue and white. And that's because there was an effort to emulate Chinese porcelain, which was blue and white and very popular. Mm -hmm. And so it, it took a, a certain amount of chemistry and experimentation to be able to figure out how to do that yeah. in a low fire situation. Um, when they didn't have availability of porcelain. The Moroccan, the Muslim potters came from the Middle East and from Northern Africa and went to Southern Spain. And so those traditions got passed up to Southern Spain. We've got two pieces right there that really, I think, reflect that, that influence, that Islamic in influence that you would have had in Al-Andalus in Southern Spain. Um, the bowl has these pierced holes in it, mm -hmm. and that comes from a particular town called Ubeda, which is near Granada. Uh, and you can see it, it really looks a lot like uh, the architecture that you would have seen. Yeah, the at, screens that you would mm -hmm, see. Yeah. Like the, with, which was Windows. done with stone. And the other piece has this metallic finish that was really desirable. And this is, this is from a particular town called Menesis, which is also in southern Spain. Um, and that was uh, uh, something that was also associated with Islamic art and architecture. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, there was this migration of these art forms from Spain when they came to the New World. And one of the centers in the New World of ceramics was Puebla, Mexico. And that's what that urn there, right there is. And you can see that it is also picking up on these very desirable blue and white Chinese imagery with it the bird Asian there. It does have it. a very yeah. Asian feel yeah. to it. And so there was still this overwhelming desire to emulate Chinese porcelain that endured from the Middle East to Southern Spain to Mexico. So that's something that having a really rich and, um, and deep collection, a deep yeah. collection yeah. allows you to do. It allows you to trace things over time and over place. So recently we had an exhibition on something that's called tramp art, which was, is a style of wood carving that came from Europe but made its way to the United States and it had, took a particular form in the United States. And what tramp art is, is it's notched and layered wood. Usually it was re recycled or repurposed wood. Uh, often it was made from cigar boxes because there was an abundance of cigar boxes. <laughs> and what do you do with your cigar boxes? You can make it into something make it into more functional. A piece of art, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and also, uh, cigar boxes were really good because they're thin, mm -hmm. and so they were easy to make these sort of V-shaped notches on the edge, and then you you layer them, getting incrementally smaller, so they get they develop this mass. And so usually they were household objects, uh, mirrors, keepsake boxes, jewelry boxes, some furniture that we have, um, crosses, a lot of sort of devotional objects. Um, I like to think that we actually have one of the best tramp art collections in the country. So here we are in one of our two textile storage rooms. Uh, over here on my left, we have the rolled textiles. And on the other side of the room, we have garments. We have hanging garments. Um, the textile collection is one of our other strengths of mm -hmm. our collection at the Folk Art Museum. And I wanted to bring this particular piece to your attention because I've had the privilege of working with it lately in preparation for an upcoming exhibition. So this is an Alaska native parka. Mm. Um, it is Saint, from St. Saint Lawrence Island. Okay. It is St. Lawrence Yupik. And it is made out of seal gut. So Seal it, gut? Seal gut. How could they ever use seal gut for this? <laughs> so it is the intestine uh, that is taken out after a hunt uh -huh. and it is dried and then um, it is oh, yeah, it flattened. has this appearance mm -hmm. of paper yes really. it does it looks like uh, and it is very waterproof and very strong it looks like it would be very fragile and there's a way in which it would be if it gets too dry uh, but it is uh, it has this beautiful translucency mm -hmm. when you have it in the right light and the details on this are, are really remarkable. So not only does it serve a very particular function to keep one dry, you would have yeah. worn this over um, some over warmer a jacket, clothing, over probably. warmer clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the stitches, it's hand stitched, oh. and you can see how fine that stitching is. And these embellishments here, these are actually auklet feathers. So auklet is a bird, okay. and above its beak, it has feathers that come out. 
And so each one of these represents one auklet feather. Oh so my it's gosh. a lot of birds. Wow, it's um, beautiful. It, it is a beautiful piece. And, and I see some... And there's fur. fur, so there's fur, more, uh, there's fur here around the, trim the around. rough. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a beautiful and rich collection, there's a lot of research to be done. And um, that's something that we have the privilege of doing when, we, when uh, we're preparing for an exhibition. But well, it's a masterpiece, it's just it is, beautiful. It is a masterpiece. I had no idea that folk art took so many interesting forms and that so many countries have their own version of this popular handmade art form reflecting the folklore and cultural life of their communities. It really is an art by all types of people for all types of people. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time. Made possible by TFI Envision, the Connection to Conversion Agency. Palomino Restaurant Group, 25 years of creative cuisine. ML Capital Partners, building the businesses of tomorrow today.